Hi, Nick here from Pods with Nick and James. Just a quick one before we get into this podcast. I'm going to say a massive thank you for the uh, support that we've received since starting these podcasts. We thoroughly enjoy it and we look forward to creating more. If you want to have your say on any topics that we've discussed or suggest future topics, then you can do so at www.reddit.com slash r slash Nick and James Pods. And if you want to support us, you can do so for uh, from as little as £1 a month. And you can do that at www.patreon.com slash James. Anyway, back to the podcast. Welcome back to Pods with Nick and James. My name's Nick. This is James. Hey there. And today we're going to be discussing Bob Lazar and other UFO sightings throughout history, but I wanted to go over a little bit about Bob Lazar. Now, I did put James through the traumatic experience of watching um, Bob Lazar UFOs in Area 51, the documentary with by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, what were your thoughts on that, James? Uh, just to uh, start off, uh, just so everyone's aware, I know this is really simple stuff, but it's not Jeremy Corbyn, the English politician. It turns out he's also, it turns out it's a different bloke who's a filmmaker. Um, it was an interesting piece. I will admit it didn't seem to quite have the coverage and traction on YouTube that I thought it would have had. Um, but maybe, I don't know, um, maybe people aren't as interested in US, UFOs uh, nowadays. I did really like how it was an amalgamation of different media from different times, and it actually really made me kind of a bit more interested in the source material. Uh, I'll also, we'll, I'm assuming we'll be going into uh, Robert Lazar's character um, one way or another as well, and it, it was very... It was very striking because it, if it was a hoax, I believe Robert Lazar would have handled things differently. Yeah. Um, like if he, if he was, you know what? Sorry, but I'll 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 go back to you and we'll we'll do some. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll comment more on that as and when you've uh, asked a, asked an appropriate question. No, you're all good. You're all good. Um, I actually really liked the documentary because um, I think it, like you said, it was formed in a very, very intriguing way. It built the the, the drama, built the story really well. Um, and it gave you the information not from some guy saying, well, you do get a bit of the, the talking head kind of um screen time but a lot of it is backed up with this is um this is like i like the fact they had the original um footage from um the original um tv the origi- broadcast the, ori- the original thing where he blacks out his face on purpose yeah using a contrast of lighting of being in the car with the camera facing towards him and out and going under the pseudo name of dennis yeah so let me go into a little bit, like for those that don't know, who is Robert Lazar? Um, so Rob or Bob, uh, Bob, <laughs> Bob, um, Bob Lazar first appeared in 1989 as an anonymous tipper on KLAS TV's 5 p.m. broadcast, where he stated that nine UFOs of varying degrees of functionality were being studied and flown at the Area 51 subsite labeled S4, where he worked. He also claimed that his life had been threatened, as had his wife's. However, he felt that he had a duty to the American people to expose what was going on at S4 as it related to technologies that could change the world. George Knapp, who was a news presenter, um, an investigative journalist, um, who investigated these claims thoroughly with great scepticism, 
his first job was to verify Bob's true identity. Now, um, Bob Lazar said he studied at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in a very secret program. He then worked at Los Alamos Air Force Base um, years before where he met Ed Teller. Do you know who Ed Teller is? No, the name sounds familiar. He's not related to the magician. No, he is no. the father of the hydrogen bomb. Oh, get out. Yeah. So, um, Bob Lazar worked at Los Alamos. He, he actually spoke to Ed Teller outside a lecture theater at Los Alamos. Um, he had the opportunity to go and sit in on a lecture with uh, by Ed Teller when he was talking about um, the physics of the hydrogen bomb and stuff. Um, and interestingly enough, that day, a newspaper article was um, released in the Los Alamos kind of like gazette, the uh, like the Air Force Base Gazette. And Bob Lazar was actually on the front of this newspaper clipping with a um, Honda that he's he had uh, strapped a jet engine into the back of, and he was he used to use it drive it to work and stuff. This two hundred pound Honda, uh, two hundred mile an hour Honda, he built a bloody jet engine into the back of um and yeah so he got talking to ed teller um and um obviously caught the guy's attention ed teller re like remembered him because um when it comes to like 87 88 he contacted ed looking for work and ed put him in touch with eg and g which was the company who were hiring for um positions in um like super secret um, science projects um, where he eventually got a job in um, or so Bob says in S4 in a section of um, Area 51 which was based in Groom Lake in Nevada um, Bob, Bob Lazar interestingly enough was asked to undergo a polygraph test um, by George Knapp to corroborate his story back in 1989. Now, Bob undertook four polygraph tests from four different uh, sources. I'd, I'd only heard that he'd done three, no. and I know the results, but it is yeah. still interesting. Yeah, he undertook four by like through through George Knapp, all with different elements of his story, all asking questions relating to different elements of his story. So it wasn't covering the same thing, so he could practice the same answers or whatever. And none of them found any intent to deceive. Um, yeah, no, it is, it is incredible, because I know that um, one of them was within the news, then, but then there were several private companies and... All of them, yeah, just didn't uh, didn't pick up, uh, didn't pick it up, and also he he took the the results from the tests and got other people to study them just to double just to yeah like double yeah watch, George Knapp did yeah his, yeah he kind of went um, okay so, I want to make sure that this is mm. like sound and that the, like let's get a second opinion on these results um, and yeah, they he, went to he, other polygraph technicians in order to like corroborate them mm. i mean i think um george knapp is interesting because he is also a showman like his uh his style so uh robert lazar comes across as actually a very quiet person although i wonder how much of that is to do with the trauma um, of dealing with what he has experienced in the form of government agencies. We'll touch upon that in a moment. Whereas, um, sorry, is it George Knapp? Is that, that his name? And is yeah. it the the lead investigative journalist who did an entire series um, on yeah. Robert Lazar's claims yeah. Yeah. Uh, back in the, the late 80s and early 90s? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, yeah, so he he has some charisma and clearly enjoys the limelight and is by no means unintelligent. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting that with George Knapp, you've got those multiple elements. Like, so he's looking for a story, 
but he is making absolutely certain that the story is as credible as he can make it to be. Yeah, I mean, he didn't approach the story going, oh, I absolutely believe this guy. Bob is a believable guy. You can mm. see that in the documentary. He comes across really level-headed. He's not, like, a sensationalist, I, I put down in no. my notes. He's not like that at all. Um, I he... love it as well, because he never even plays into sarcasm. No. Like when they talk about the the situation at work, like when he talks about how you he had people um, rhythmically shouting at him as a form of his gnosis, and like uh, George Knapp goes, huh, sounds like a fun place to work. And he goes, well, no, it wasn't. Um, but it was worth it in order to get to touch this. Yeah. Sorry, back to yeah. you. Back no, to absolutely. You. You're absolutely right. So... Um... He yeah, there were when he started to come out about the stuff in um S four, he was he was being um ridiculed by people at work and it was um he he felt like they were using um their voices in a form of like hypnosis and torture to kind of get him to like really be uncomfortable at work. Um and um, but he still would put he would he he wanted to be there he he genuinely wanted to be part of 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 something inc- incredible and the technology that he had the opportunity to interact with he was worth more than than the kind of treatment he was getting from his peers at work um and he outwardly said that to to george knapp um which i think is in, is, is incredible um george knapp went through absolutely everything though to try and um should we say debunk Bob Lazar like he went through the whole rig and roll he went through he he looked at his um MIT um training and could find nothing about the guy and immediately started to doubt that he was who he said he was um and then he went through uh, Los Alamos um, and everybody he spoke to over at Los Alamos, nobody had ever heard of him, apparently. Um, and then he went to EG&G and nobody there had ever heard of him. Um, and like, there was so much that was kind of debunking Bob Lazar for him. However, when he dug deeper, he began to realise... And um, the only thing that they've never been able to find record of is his um, time at MO- MIT. But it's said that that was because of a uh, because of the program that he was working on. It was um, extremely confidential, tongue in cheek, kind of really dangerous stuff that he was working on. Um, and it, like nobody wanted anybody else to know about it, let alone who was working on it. That's why he's not recorded anywhere. However, Los Alamos, um, like George Knapp went with Bob to Los Alamos and um, George Knapp described it as a rabbit entering the, like the, uh, the run. He knew exactly where he was going all the way through Los Alamos, even waving at people as he went by because he knew them. Like, you don't get that kind of reception in a place where you've never been, you know? Um, mm. The guy that interviewed him at eg and he was able to name. Um, and, like, you shouldn't... If you, did, if you didn't have anything to do with the company, like... You shouldn't know the people that work there. And Jeremy Corbyn in the pod, in, not in the podcast, um, in the documentary, even says that he managed to find the guy that interviewed him and spoke with him, and he could remember Bob Lazar. So there was an interview there for EG and G, um, and that seconded, like he knew about S four. S4 was a sub-site in Area 51, which was incredibly secret at the time. But this is 1989. Barely anybody even knew about Area 51. And just for those younger listeners there, um, this is before the time of Google. I'll let you know that public internet was released in 1991. So he couldn't even look up this kind of stuff on the internet in 1989 when he came clean. So the stuff that he knew 
He knew because he had a reason to know it. He didn't know it because um, he did his research. Um, like, and the people that he says he knew, knew him. Um, the only people who didn't were the organizations where he seems to have just been scrubbed from them. Like, it's really interesting that people can try to debunk a story like Bob Lazar um, when like there's, there's certain things outside of the like the outside of the sensational and the incredible things that he states the less um the less um let's say the less sensational the less um what's the word subjective um points of his story are factual and when you tend when you find somebody who is making a sensational sensational story they don't do the background work <laughs> yeah they're not going to make sure that they know the Georges and the Franks that run the front desk um, in order to really show a good foundation to a story, which is what, uh, which is another point that I think is really interesting about Bob Lazar's. Like, it's all there. So if there's stuff around the edges, the bits that are inconsequential are completely factual. Just because the bit in the middle is sensational and incredible, does it make it any less believable? In my opinion, it surely makes it more believable. It, I, what I really... Mm, I think we, we should get to what Bob Lazar's claims are, but it does seem that he... I think there may have even been a like a piss-take Simpsons episode on this. Yeah, uh, I can remember Bob Mr. Lazar. With, with, yeah, with um, with uh, Mr. Burns and stuff. But um, it is the really... Mm, there were elements of the doc documentary which, sorry, documentary which seemed somewhat sensational. Like when they did the, the voiceovers with the professional, incredibly deep voiced voice actor yeah um talking about philosophical questions yeah. whilst loads of images of either space or different things were were shown that was the one sensationalist bit about this the rest of it was all all seemed to be fairly le legitimate yeah and it's like, important to only... remember that that was jeremy corbyn's addition to the bob mm. lazar story that wasn't bob mm. yeah no this is the thing what the only element like the, the only element which i think that it even might be a hoax is partly because of just the sheer the sheer terror and then also the other a lot of other questions of well if what he says is true then what does that mean for now what does that mean for other countries do other countries have the the same resources as the united states have like how come this stuff hasn't been like backwardly engineered like what is going on here i the only thing that makes me even partially um think that it's fake is that that is the lack of success when it comes to or the fact that it hasn't been replicated by the united states or by another government um, and, I, and you could quite easily like explain that away by saying, "Oh well, they're all in cahoots," or the technology is just that advanced that it can't that we're not at a point when we can backwardsly engineer it. Yeah, you're so. So I. Oh, sorry. Oh, so um, I go on. No, go on. I don't think he did it to become famous. Um, because I'm going to be honest with you. Until you mentioned him. I literally I'd forgotten. I think he was famous at the time and he was taking a lot of abuse at the time and then he retreated into his shell and has gone and done science in a laboratory producing different aerospace materials. If he if he wasn't intelligent, he wouldn't have been able to do that. 
if he wasn't educated, he wouldn't have been able to work at the places that he work that he worked at. Unless something else is going on and he's just twisted the truth a little bit to get his 15 minutes of fame or whatever, then he's paid for it massively and horribly. He doesn't shout shout about it, so it's not it doesn't seem like he wants the attention, but at the same time, he's never changed his story. He's never said, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I wanted, you know, um, I was going through a rough patch with my wife. I really wanted this attention from this waitress. So I made up this big lie. That's never happened. Like, he's, he said what he said and then disappeared. Then, um, I think he, like, the weird thing is, um, I, I think he might have, I know you said it was uh, 1989. Was was that the original original or because I think he may have done the the thing when he was blacked out in the car. That was May nineteen eighty nine. That was May nineteen eighty nine. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It just seems like he's he's paid for it, and unless it's just the fact that he's, I hate to say it, I I I think he is on the spectrum. Um, I mean, the guy's a genius. Like, He's absolutely incredibly yeah, smart. Yeah, like I, I just, I, I hate to say it, but because it sounds like a, a, you know, I'm, I'm tarring him with an insult or a brush. No, he, he is incredibly, he is incredibly intelligent. It's just, <sighs> the one part of me that makes me think he's doubt it is whether he did it as maybe a little joke. And then paid paid a horrible price for it with the abuse, and there and now is just like if if anything, it he kind of reminds me a little bit of Walter White from the series Breaking Bad, at least in the first season. The naivety just, about him. There is a very slight naivety i think maybe in the and earlier that, videos definitely yeah when you yeah. look at the older material you maybe see a little bit of um like naivety about what he expected to come from it um like from his expose um yeah i think maybe he expected the government to like or the public to get more um strong-minded about it whereas really what happened was um he got shunned and ridiculed instead um it's interesting you say about the joke thing because um like i thought if it was going to be a joke it the point where it was a joke was when he took his mates out to area 51 to video um like the the test flights of these ufos which is something that he did at the time um he took a load of his friends out into the desert and it's and he took them straight to the test flight um, area, which was a different part of um, the Nevada desert entirely. He was on Groom Lake, and it was on a completely different lake bed where they were doing these test flights. Um, and if he was going to like have a big joke about it, it would have been at that point, I think, um, in the mentality of, of sensationalism, he would have planned this big... Um, prank then but they were confronted by military operatives whilst yeah, they were is, there yeah like this is the weird thing it, the government almost collabor collaborates his story through their reactions um, so if uh, if this hasn't already been stated clearly enough um, to our listeners just to repeat this um, Robert Lazar uh, came to the media and said that um, I'm one of the scientists who works at Area 51 or in the branch of S4, um, that the US government has nine um, semi-operational, some fully operational, but nine uh, flying saucers of an extraterrestrial um, origin uh, that it is currently Test doing test flights with uh, successful test flights, and that it and that the U.S. government is currently disassembling the less active ones um, in order to try and backwardsly engineer them. 
and this was at this point um, 35 years ago. So I'm kind of wondering what's happened to that technology or why we haven't seen even the, the slightest um, change uh, in, in our technology. Um, another thing that he said is he, is he talked about how these worked and it all sounded really far out and really theoretical but I'm going to be honest with you and when describing this sort of stuff it's impossible not to yeah for it yeah, to I sound agree. that way like it's just like you know what what was he supposed to say ah oh, well we were expect you know I opened up the the flying saucer and it turns out there were a bunch of little pixies in there <laughs> or you know like ah oh, it turns out they just pedaled um that there's no way where you can take something like that and then make it make it rational um the things that terrify me about this is that first off he talks about an antimatter reactor um i don't know enough about physics but i know that that's incredibly dangerous i know my my dad, who did know something about physics, um, was actually slightly worried and troubled by uh, the particle accelerators, or sorry, the Hadron Collider, um, as recreating some of the conditions of the Big Bang. You've got a large margin of what can happen there, where the smallest margin is nothing happens, and the biggest margin is, oh, well, you've you've broken physics in this way and he kind of felt that my dad my dad kind of felt like you get two particles to collide and then all of a sudden the screen goes black and this little white game over comes up yeah exactly exactly or um it sets off some kind of chain reaction or it creates a miniature black hole even for a split second and then what the effect would be of that um so an antimatter reactor immediately terrifying um gravity amplifiers is also what he um talked about when it came to the dissembling of the craft and like where they were arranged um and then uh gravity emitters which would then channel uh yeah channel channel the gravity i did like the fact that he was clearly intelligent in that he was talking about how all current aircraft all craft are reaction um engines like they produce a force which then they push the universe, out back yeah yeah they push out back exactly whereas this is completely the opposite of it yeah. creates a gravity field it cre it bends space in front of it and the object falls into it that's the way that he described it Mm. It bends gravity in front of the object and co causes like a like a, a greater magnetic attraction ahead of the object, and then the object falls into that space. Well, that that's exactly it. And like, I guess what I would have expected is for the smartest minds on Earth to have figured some of this stuff out, and maybe to have done it in the guise of i don't know like a train which is pulled along the track by these stationary um these stationary stations which or these like maybe things in the track which like slowly but surely pull pull the train along it you mean you know, kind of like a bullet train in china um is that literally how that works? It's um, it's a tube with, um, like a floating magnetic tube train inside, and mm. electromagnets along the inside uh, along the inside of the um tube tunnel kind of pull the train along and then reverse polarity. So then they're pushing the train away as well at the same time, um, and because it's floating, there's no drag and it can travel up to ridiculous speeds. Okay, well, maybe this is just a case of my own ignorance because I hadn't heard of that one. I knew the Japanese had 
uh, bullet trains um, and I traveled on one as a child, but um, yeah, I wasn't aware of. Uh... I mean, the technology, the, the theoretical technology is there. Um, let me let me talk about some of the stuff that isn't UFO related that he did mention, because I think there's some really interesting stuff there. Now, um, he mentioned biometric readers in 1989. Um, he mentioned a finger, not, not even a fingerprint scanner, it was a hand bone scanner. And you put your hand down on this plate. Well, this was like the security protocol when you walked into the building of S4. Like you'd put your hand down on this plate and it would scan the bones in your hand and measure the bones in your hand. And that was your key card to get into the building. Um, and of course, in 1989, there was nothing like this around, and everybody said complete cocky pot, like absolute bull crap, um, and there's nothing like it. But in the in the um, in the documentary, Jeremy Corbyn shows him a picture of the biometric scanner that he himself described, and when I found it after all this time. I found this in the US military records. This is a biometric scanner from around the time that you were, um, and it was operative in some of the highest classified Air Force bases in the country. Um, and Literally, the stealth bomber, they, they used the same scanner. Yeah. That is something that I, uh, that I thought was kind of really interesting because it was just like, okay, that's around the same time. Yep. That was also top secret. Yep. And despite it being, you know, despite governments and militaries being compartmentalized, it's a, sadly that does. Well, I, I don't I don't say sadly, I guess part of me doesn't want Bob Lazar's story to be true, because then it really means that. It really brings up the question to me, what else have people figured out that we're just not allowed to use? like and yeah I, I don't know it really kind of um concerns me but it, it, you're right you're right it's it's an incredible um <laughs> it really it really does add to the credibility of his story because i i did like that jeremy Cor um corbyn showed for the first time yeah yeah Got he, his he reaction. showed both the image the image the reaction, but also he's got the old stuff that Bob Lazar said. Yep. And as Bob Lazar explains it, yeah, it sounds fucking. It, it it sounds unrealistic. It sounds freaky. And then you see the device, and it's just like, uh, oh, oh, yeah, that. Okay. And the look on his face is genuine as well. It's recognition. You see instant recognition on his face, and he's like, wow, how have you found this? Um, I just think it, there's, there's moments where you can see, and this is why I like the way that Jeremy kind of like put, the, put the documentary together, because there are numerous moments throughout that where um, he kind of catches Bob off guard, trying to ca trip him up, trying to, to catch him out. And Bob's reaction is 100% every time. Like, there's times where he goes, oh, th there's people that say about misinformation, and he goes, yeah, but what have, what have I got to gain from this? What have I gained out of this? If this was misinformation, like, what have I done that, that, like, that I've benefited from here? You know, and there's there's moments where he's like, there's there's time, like, do you think um, if you could go back, you'd change what? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. I would absolutely not say what um, what I said because I could have, I could have still been working on those UFOs. I wanted to be working on those UFOs, and I didn't know that that talking about it would end up with me not being able to work on those UFOs. I just thought people needed to know. Um, there was also Element One Fifteen. Uh, which at the time there was no Element One Fifteen, and once again he was slated to the ground about element 115 and he described it as this stable um stable element which was used to bend gravity and there was mention of a um a cloud chamber um, um test where element 115 was a cloud 
uh, poured across element 115 and light shone across um, the surface of element 115 and you can see the light bend I haven't seen the video myself but that's the that's the explanation of the video as George Knapp saw it and as Bob Lazar had it however Jeremy Corbyn managed to find the tape but half of it was taped over all you see is the beginning of the uh, the the cloud chamber experiment you just see the cloud chamber and then a bit of cloud come into it but you don't see the element you don't see the light you don't see any of that um, which is unfortunate however um element 115 was discovered by scientists in 2003 question mark hold on 2003 yeah 2003 however when they synthesized element 115 it lasted a matter of 200 nanoseconds before it destabilized and fell apart into different elements. Um, and people say, oh, like, it can't be, it, it's unstable. It can't be element, uh, it can't be element one, 115. It, like, Bob's got to be lying. Um, but every element has got different structures, different isotopes, different means to, to form. And some are, some are stable and some are unstable. The way that they've synthesized 115 in this particular instance was unstable that does not mean that element 115 cannot be found in a stable setting what i really like like um bob lazar did a podcast on uh did uh, uh, the joe rogan podcast after this documentary came out um and he kind of explains in a bit more detail what he meant and it's almost like he's implying that the technology that these these UFOs are showing come from a world where element 115 is an abundant resource and that's the normal um technology that they've used we we have a world where we've built all of our technology around fossil fuels um because that's the that's the resource that we have and all of our technology and all of our all of our um um, investigations and 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 kind of development has come through how do we get the most out of this resource that we have um he kind of hypothesized that element 115 is the resource they have and although it looks incredible to us they probably feel the same about the way that we push our cars around the way that we fly cut fly our planes around the sky that may well be why there's a lot of investigation into us as far as like these ufo sightings that have, that have come up quite a bit um i don't necessarily feel that that's the case i think there are a lot of links between um the ufo sightings that have happened um since 1945 onwards um and the nuclear bomb I think until we launched a nuclear bomb, we were of little to no interest um, to anybody from the outside world. And as soon as we showed that we have planetary destructive level power, um, it kind of drew the attention of, of beings from outside of our solar system um because and the, the the evidence uh, there is a new york times article which i have got open and i just want to read you a little clip um it's about an investigation that the uh the national defense authorization act it's called and um, which funds the Def defense department's annual operating budget budget in the u.s right um and it's 858 billion in the in 2023 and in that um is an amendment which requires the department to review historical documents related to unidentified aerial phenomena which is just u.s government's lingo for ufos dating to 1945 this is the year that according to one account a large avocado shaped object struck a communication tower in a patch of new mexico desert now known as the trinity site where the world's first atomic bomb was detonated that july interesting um I think it's really interesting that they actually genuinely want to investigate 
um, this sighting before the Roswell ac accident in 1947 um, that nobody really knew anything about but apparently happened in 1945 at the same place where they launched the first nuclear bomb where they tested the first nuclear bomb. So I think there's a lot. Of, and if you listen to a lot of the UFO sightings from um, people that worked with the military, they were nearly always on um, nuclear sites. There was actually a, um, a report of um, nuclear missiles going into shutdown um, and all of them becoming... Um, what's the word when nuclear, mis nuclear materials become... Um, is it inert? Inert, yeah. They made all the all the nuclear warheads inert, like these orbs that were floating around this military base, um, on the site. And this was around the Cold War, um, and this was in the US. It's worth looking up. I can't think of what it was called right now, but um, there is a reference to that. Um, so I think nuclear bombs have got a massive part to play in what drew the attention of. UFOs um, in this century or in the last thousand years, uh, in the last hundred years at least. Um, but it's important to note that the Nazis themselves were designing um, UFOs. No, yeah, no, this is something um, my housemate brought up with me. Um, he was talking about how flying saucers did exist in the US, but they weren't using antimatter reactors, gravity amplifiers, gra gravity deflectors, that there were just these craft which had jet engines inside them arranged in a spiral so that it created this spinning motion which in total created a downwards thrust. Um, but I haven't done... I'm really sorry, mate. I was this was brought up with me just an hour before this. It's fine because this is like my area of expertise, shall we say? So the UFOs okay. that the Nazis were working on were part of the secret space program that the Nazis had during the Second World War. Now, during Project Paperclip, at the end of the Second World War, um, the Nazi scientists that weren't killed in like the end of the war were boxed up and shared between the US and the, and the, and the Russians. And um, the and NASA was formed, and and this, the Russian space program was formed, um, and a number of the scientists also joined things like the uh, Manhattan Project and worked on the nuclear bomb and stuff like that. Um, so, like scientists from the the Nazi secret space program, kind of continued their research in more of a um, a Western appreciated kind of manner. Um, over in the US, um, and there are images of um, like Nazi UFOs that you can go and see um, on Google. And it, like you said, it, 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 it's not, they weren't stable, they weren't, they were jet propelled, they weren't through like any kind of anti gravitic energy system, they were just um, like jet propelled. Um, spinning objects that were incredibly dangerous because nine times out of ten they ended up blowing up or crashing and the people that were test flying them died. Um, so they weren't the most successful. However, they did exist and they were um, based on or reverse engineered by like from these sources that were apparently um, like crashing around. I think there was one crash in Italy where um, the Pope um, picked up on it and then handed it over to the Nazis during the Second World War, and that's what kind of led to the Nazi um, spacecraft being designed. Um, and it was kept very hush-hush during the Second World War, obviously. As we know, the Italians and the, and the Nazis were hand-in-hand -hand during the Second World War, so it doesn't sound outlandish that the Italians would hand it off to them. Um, you know, they were they were allied. They were part of that. Like they had their own their own thing. Was it was uh, their leader Franco at that time, or was it Mus Mussolini? I think it was Mussolini, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Mussolini was um, big bad from Italy from the Italians at that point. Um, 
but that's that's just a bit of the backstory, I suppose. It it, it just makes um, like he says they had nine, and you can hear you can kind of pick out at least through the articles that I've read in the last forty eight hours that there were at least three that had crashed. Roswell, this Trinity site, and the one in Italy, um, that would have all ended up in the US's hands by the time Bob Lazar was at S4. And there's no saying how many more there would have been. So you can kind of, like, as much as nine UFOs, you kind of sit there and go, wow, that's a lot. Um, but no, like, you know what? If they could, if if three were just by nineteen fifty, there's another thirty years before Bob Lazar works there. Thirty-five years, and I guess that's the thing that really has kind of made me. I don't know. Like I, I really don't want to believe that technology in today's day and age is as stunted um as a lot of theories would suggest that it is because if 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 technology is stunted then it means all the harm that we're doing to the planet and all the death that is caused by the increasing um well climate change could quite easily be solved if the te- if the technology has not been suppressed yeah what what stuff could we achieve with with like with these sort with these sources you yeah, know like with, what not just that but like think about um think about the the uh generally how like the guy like bob lazar was talking about the anti gravity module being used as like a force field like you put a force field around Earth, and you never have to worry about meteor impacts again. But in order for us to be able to have technology on that scale, you'd need everybody to be working together, right? Yeah. But you can't because everybody wants their little bit of it. Um. Now you say that technology doesn't exist or might not exist, or it, it's kept, or you hope that it doesn't exist because it means that it's been kind of kept out of our eyesight. But well, it, it, It's also the moral implications. Like, yeah. And all I can say is, like, if when that finally does register in my heart, my heart will respond with hatred to those who are holding it back, just as any kind of system which is um, too full of control... Uh, for example, um, like Christendom in the in the medieval era, like it, I just think anger and hatred is the natural response to any form of over controlling authority, and it's just like if we've got all of these, we've got all these problems, and if it turns out that we had the solution to solve them all along then like that's not an act of omission like i i believe that there's you know that when it comes to action and inaction i i believe that guilt is normally on the part of those who actively do a bad thing but holding back technology is actively doing a bad thing yeah yeah you know it's it's not just oh well actually i'm just going to put this in a box for a minute like no 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 because in order to get your hands on it and be the one who chooses whether it goes in a box what have you done in order to do that and why did you do it you know yeah ah oh, sorry back to back to bob lazar well um well, no, uh... let's 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 move on let's let's talk about more modern day um sightings so um i want to kind of bring in um, discussions around uh, Commander David Fravor and his sightings of the mm. uh, the Nimit incident, the Tic Tac. Um, so let's give a little bit of backstory on David Fravor for a minute. Now, 
Commander David Fravor is a retired naval pilot who commanded the, the VSA-41, also known as the Black Aces in the U.S. Air Force, uh, in the U.S. Navy. He joined the military at 17 and had a career spanning 24 years, 18 of which was as a Navy pilot. He had completed five tours in the Persian Gulf, starting after Operation Desert Storm, um, and he commanded a squadron of airplanes consisting of 330 people. He is a key witness in the 2004 Nimitz incident titled The Tic Tac. He retired in 2006. Um, that's just my notes that I've pulled up on David Fravor. And the reason I wanted to give that backstory a little bit is to tell you that like, the guy that brought forwards the evidence or witnessed the sighting of the Tic Tac was a revered commander in the US Navy. He wasn't a crazy scientist guy from Nevada. He worked with technologies where you have to be mentally tested to be sound enough to have command of them. He also took command of 300 plus people and had to check that their mentality was of sound mind to be able to fly the planes that they were flying and operate the machines they were operating. Um, so he knew the severity of great technology and how it should be handled and, and kind of was, was deemed to have sound mind when he made this sighting. Now, um, for those that don't know the Nimitz incident, it's labelled as the Tic Tac, as, as, as I said in my notes, and you can see it on YouTube. There's a couple of others that you should look into as well. There's one titled The Go Fast, which I think is an absolutely incredible sighting um, uh, recorded and um, out on YouTube. And there's also The Gimbal, which is one that I want to I want to touch on a little bit rel relative to De uh, Bob Lazar. Now, um, David Fravers, um, just to give a little bit of in like uh, backstory for those that can't see it, um, he says that he saw a um, bit of whitewash on the surface of the water, and when he turned the plane towards it, he saw an object um, hovering across, like above the surface of the water. And um, then the object started to move really erratically, almost like he describes it like a um, pinball being bounced around inside of a glass. Like kind of going ding 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 all around like really sharp turns, really quick movements, side to side, up up and down and stuff like that. And it drew his attention and he thought, wow, this object is incredible. Um so he turned his plane towards it and he, he kind of as soon as he started moving towards it, it started to um track his movements and fly in time with him. So he it kind of stayed a set a set distance away from him. Um, and at the same time, his second um, or his his operations manager, the, the guy in the back seat that operates all the the um, radar equipment and everything, noticed that it was actively jamming a lot of his radar systems. So he wasn't able to get a lock on it in the way that the computers wanted to. They wanted to read about it and kind of like tell him how far away it was and how fast it was going and he couldn't get any of that data because it like immediately started to jam now that in itself is an act of war anything that actively seeks to jam aircraft um in the field it's seen as an act of war by the american um and like it's it's kind of go time they they kind of get their back up and and decide but he decided he would try to track it and they followed it for about five minutes i say followed it it followed them they followed it it got they kind of kept an eye on it for about five minutes at which point it just disappeared um and he said the the speed that it moved off was like nothing that he'd seen before he this is a commander of the u.s navy he'd flown the f-22 raptor like he has been in the fastest aircraft that we have in the air or the US have in the air. And um, he said, we've got nothing that can do that. Nothing at all. Um, and the most incredible thing about the Tic Tac incident is that it turned up 
the object that he was tracking turned up at his cat point, which um, for those that don't know, a cat point is his next point of interest, the place he was going to next. But he it got there before he even had those coordinates. It was over 60 miles away and they found it floating in the air there and it had already been there less than a minute later. Like they, they found the object floating in the air at his cat point, not watched it come in and then found it there, but kind of went, oh, what the fuck is that up there? Um, like it was already there less than a minute later, 60 miles away, um, which was incredible to even conceive like a mile a second. Um, and yet it was already there. So it traveled there faster than that. Um, what I, what I found interesting as well is when he is talking about his experience with this, he said it was there and then it wasn't. And then he goes into great detail about how he's worked with a number of, um, yeah, a number of super, uh, sonic aircraft, how he's watched a number of, um, NASA aircraft. Uh, flying at Mach 3, uh, which is something also I wasn't aware of, but then again, I'm not as much into aviation as I was as a child, so I maybe need to get back into that. But he's talked about how when something goes at Mach 3, he can't catch it and it disappears, but he's able to watch it disappear. Yeah. Whereas what he's saying, what happened with um, the Tic Tac was it was there in front of his nose. And then it was gone. Yeah. It was just gone. Um, and like he, like none of this was like, people assume that this, this sighting would have then been like men in black coats came and glasses came and told them what was shut up and hush hush and it was really confidential, but there was none of that. Like they landed at their aircraft uh, carrier, the Nimitz, and they were debriefed. And the guys on the aircraft carrier all took the piss out of them, and they um, like played Men in Black and stuff on the cinema just to kind of dig out the guys that had seen this UFO. And there was all this funny talk about seeing a UFO, and it was just general banter that you would expect to see from the Air Force or from the Navy, from your comrades at at, at sea. Um, none of it was like this cloak and dagger kind of um, super secret. Um, scenario that you kind of get fed by the media um which is what i think is really interesting about this particular um recount um but the other really interesting thing about this recount is who david fravor is now obviously i said about who david fravor is as a commander who he is as an individual this is a guy that used to mock ufos yeah you genuinely didn't believe in them had no interest in them he would. There was a uh, a site near the, one of their air, one, one of their navy bases, um, which was um, renowned for UFO sightings, and they knew it at the air at the uh, air base. And he used to fuck with the people that were camping there. By um, it would be pitch black at night, and he would go into complete ghost mode on on his aircraft. So the lights are all off, the engines shut off, so that there's no no sound from it, and it's completely dark. And then you'd fly right into this campsite, and then all of a sudden he'd slam the lights on, slam the afterburner on, and be beam off in towards the sky. And he's like chuckling away to himself. That's going to be a UFO sight in the next day. And he's talking about this whilst whilst he's on. Um, Joe Rogan podcast, um, and he's chuckling away to himself like that. We used to play those games, and it's not just him. That's kind of like what the like. That's kind of like one of the games that they play with the public. Like they make UFO sightings, so they don't take this stuff seriously at all. And yet, he genuinely is taking this seriously. Yeah, that's it. And it's just once again, it's like, what does he have to gain from that? Exactly. Nothing. Like, I mean, if the, anything, it looks like a black mark on his otherwise near perfect record. Yeah, I mean, the guy's the guy's retired from the navy. He's done his bit. He's earned his money. He's done more than his bit for the U.S. Um, 
He doesn't need any more fame. He doesn't need any more of it. He doesn't even want it, I don't think. Um, but he is a witness in an ongoing investigation by the Senate in the US. And he'll do what he needs to do for his country. So if he if he gets asked questions about something that he's witnessed, he's not being told to shut up about it, he'll, he'll talk about it, you know? Um, but the, let's go back to the gimbal. Now, the gimbal is a sighting by the US Navy or the Air Force which I think is really interesting because um, in the in the video, it clearly shows a UFO hovering in or an object hovering um, in the in the air. And before it buggers off into nowhere, um, it rotates, which is why it kind of got the name the gimbal, because it rotates and it moves off into the edge of the picture belly first. Bob Lazar covers this um, when he talks to Joe Rogan, and he says like that. It, no, actually, um, when Joe and Jeremy are talking to David Fravor on the Joe Rogan, they're talking about the way that Bob Lazar describes the way that his UFOs would move. They'd move belly first, and they go. Interestingly enough, that UFO moves belly first, like it it travels the way that. Um, Bob Lazar was describing these UFOs back in 1989. Um, uh, to be fair, th that is when all three of the gravity arrays um, focus in on the same point. Um, so, like, when it comes to... So it can move in any other direction, but in order to allow it to move at full speed, it would move belly first. So I'm assuming with this incident it's moving around normally and then it goes belly first and then it disappears yeah. because yeah. it moves that quickly. Yeah. What yeah, I struggle exactly. with this stuff as well is when people are talking about, oh, well, um, oh yeah, well, that's not something we make because it's moving too fast. It's also can't be something we make because if we put humans inside of something, there's limits to what the human body can withstand. You know? You like say there are that. limits to you say to... that. Now let me explain oh, okay. something to all you. Right, okay? All right, all right, I'll hear so something. If if you like you're thinking about it as inertia, right? So mm. you're looking at an object that's moving around. You're thinking, my God, that thing's moving around so fast. If I was in that, I'd be splatting on one wall, splatting on the other wall, splatting on another wall, splatting on another wall. I would die. Yeah. Mm. Um. But the only reason that object can move that way is because it's generating its own gravitational field. If it's generating its own gravitational field, it's operating outside of the gravitational effects of planet Earth, which is what creates inertia. Shit. So what you're saying is anyone, you could literally be on the inside that flying saucer and you wouldn't feel a bloody thing. You wouldn't feel a bloody. OK, right. All right, well, I've learned something new, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yep, that's fair. That's fair. Okay. And that's that's not on. necessarily um, that's not necessarily um, like Bob Lazar or, or David Fravor. That kind of um, that's logic that dictates that meant that that thinking, um, because we're moving through space. We don't feel. The effect of moving through space because we're within a gravitational bubble of planet earth yeah like this was spinning at over 100 miles an hour i can't remember the exact thing we are traveling 600 space. and something or other mile an hour yep yeah um weirdly enough this is also um one of the points that I love that ancient philosophers would use to prove that the Earth is the middle center of the universe because the Earth doesn't move. Because if the Earth was moving, they'd use the plan of inertia and like they'd just jump up in the air and then land in the same spot. And they were like, okay, well, if the Earth was moving, I wouldn't have landed there, I would have landed somewhere else. Um, but anyway, that's another topic for another time. Um, well, I'm, okay, when I'm on the train with my kid, I like to sit with him and we kind of sit there on the train and we say that um, we're not moving. The train's not moving. The world's moving around us. 
Love it. And he, he loves playing that little game on the train where the world is moving around him and the train's not. Like, the train's wheels are moving to keep up with the way that the Earth is moving. And I'm like, it's incredibly, despite the fact it is whatever, like however you might see, perceive it as wrong, there's also elements of it which are, if the train's travelling in the right direction as the Earth is spinning, there might be at least moving towards slowing down to a point of standstill. If you're travelling on a plane, travelling against the spin of the Earth at 650 mile an hour, are you not standing still on that plane? Is that not the only time that you will find yourself standing still? Mm. No, that's a fair point. That's Interesting, fair but point. anyway, there's a complete bloody tangent. But yeah, um, so... I just think that there is so much. Um, that, I mean, the, the the point that I was trying to make about David Fravers' um, sighting is that he quite clearly says, "Oh, this is nothing that humans could have could have achieved." And I don't I don't necessarily know that you can um, rule that out because if in 1989 Bob Lazar and his story was true. And they reverse engineered aircraft that were behaving in the same way that David Fravor, uh, David Fravor's craft was um, behaving in 2000 and, 2006, 2000, you know, he retired, you know, two, uh, 2004. Um, then that's 25 years, 15, sorry, 15 years. Um, they had to work on that technology before it could have got to that point. That's in the in the cloak. Uh, what's what do they call it in the, uh, the shadow government that is operating within the U.S. That's more than achievable. Like these companies, like um, Lockheed Martin, their skunk work sector that operate completely in secret. The Raytheon company, which operates completely in secret, its secret uh, technologies um, that you have no idea what they're what they're working on. They they may well have designed a vehicle that is um, that is able to achieve these things. Um, Carl Sagan said, "The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence." which I think is a really poignant um, saying to kind of round off this podcast. Um, I'm not saying that humans do have technology like this. What I am saying is that you can't rule out that we do, that we don't. Um, but likewise, you can't rule out that UFOs are coming from other places and we're seeing those either because we have not got enough evidence in the public domain to say one way or the other. To have an opinion that is concretized and affirmed and 100% is almost to be naive in this instance. And to be open-minded will only pave the way for your fear and your surprise and your... Um, shock and all the other emotions that may well come with some kind of revelation down the road to be lessened and you'll be better prepared to process the information as and when it arrives. Complete, um, completely agree. I'm still not sure where I stand with all of this, but um, it's still a very interesting case study and does raise a lot of questions and has me questioning a lot of stuff, which is never a bad thing. Well, I'm going to round it off there. So once again, from myself and from James, thank you very much for listening. I'll say goodbye. Bye, everyone.